Tina Charlotte. Sarah Euler. Kayla Freitag. Shyla Rathel. Ben Pagel. Hi, my name is Kayla. Before accepting the Lord as my Savior, I didn't respect the teachers my teachers and my parents all the time. I was growing up a Christian but fell away and then my nephew died almost three months ago. 2019 was a bad year. I wasn't putting God first. Um, at the age of high school through adult, high, adult world, um, I started getting involved in drugs and craziness and I went to jail and I went to prison um, and I just realized at that point that enough was enough and it was time I had to change. And I just know that I can't be the husband that she needs without Jesus today. I just wanted to get baptized because I want to be closer to Jesus and I want to love him for the rest of my life. So, Charlotte, um, have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want to keep growing with Jesus and read God's word as much as possible. Lord and Savior. Yes. God is so much bigger than our problems, our everything. I'm saying yes to following God. Based on profession of your faith and before God made witnesses today, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, today, if you place your faith in Jesus Christ, Yeah, come on. You guys act like someone just made par at the Masters. I mean, I think six people just got baptized. Come on, let's give it up for God. Yeah. Amen. I mean, how amazing is it to see lives change? I mean, that's what it's all about, folks. Wow. My heart is just full after watching that. That was my first time seeing that. That's fantastic. I think it's just absolutely amazing. I love what the video said at the end. This is why we pray. This is why we give. This is why we serve. This is why. This is the why for changed lives, for seeing people come into the family of God. I just think that's a wonderful uh, thing for us to celebrate. But also, I want us to remember those names on the screen, those faces. When you see those people, encourage them. Pray for them. Help them grow in their newfound faith in Christ and their new professed faith in Christ. Help them to grow in that by us sharpening one another. They're going to help you grow. You're going to help them grow. That's what we're supposed to be as a church. Amen? It's not just, yay, go God, and now we just move on to the next thing. No, it's like, all right, now the real work begins where we walk together. So let's make sure that we don't neglect to do that because that's really the part that matters on our end, that we need to pray, we need to get involved, we need to get connected. So if you see those people, encourage them. If they come to mind, even if you don't remember their name, remember those faces, remember this moment, pray for them. 
and look for opportunities to encourage them. I'm excited to be able to teach today uh, the Word of God. We're going to go through Galatians, um, and uh, we're going to go through uh, the first and third chapter, uh, respectively, of Galatians today. So if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and go there. And while you're turning, let me just pray over us real quick. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that you give me your words to speak to your people. May your words be heard by your people and may it create the type of heart change, the type of eternal impact that will bring you honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've been attending Word of Grace for some time, you've probably heard me talk in generalities about the way that I grew up and different teachers and things like that that maybe I had heard uh, and grew up with in different doctrines and different ideas, but I've always been, for the most part, pretty general about it. But I want to give you specific examples today because it's, I think it's going to help you in light of where we're at in our world. Uh, I want to just flip over real quick. You don't have to turn over there with me because I told you to go to Galatians, and, and I am going to go there. But for example's sake... I just want to give you an example of some of the teaching that perhaps I heard growing up that um, later I grew up to uh, see as I studied God's Word, uh, and I began to see clearly in the Scripture how to discern what was actually true. Mark 11, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 23 and 24, the Scripture says, Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up, be thrown into the sea, does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it, and it will be yours. Now that's uh, Jesus speaking there, and he's actually giving his disciples a lesson after this prophesied fig tree was uh, going to wither. He cursed this fig tree, and the disciples came back. They marveled that the fig tree had withered, and Jesus said, where's your faith? Why don't you have faith? And he gave this. Now, the way that I heard it uh, most of my adolescence uh, until I came to my eyes being opened to see the truth in God's Word, uh, what we were taught was that that scripture was really the basis for pretty much us getting anything that we wanted from God. Because if we could just say it, and if we could say it long enough, and we could just do it right, have enough faith, maybe give enough, whatever the case may be, we would use that scripture. And it's pulled out of context, and it really has deceived a lot of people. And I grew up in that uh, under teachers like uh, Creflo Dollar, Bill Johnson, Kenneth Copeland. They claim that humans are little g gods. And this is also the basis of where teachers like Joel Osteen will say, if you can just speak it, it will happen. Say to yourself, you're attractive, you're in shape, you're healthy, you're wealthy, you're wise, and it's just going to happen. Now understand something. Your words do matter. This scripture does have truth, and your words do have power, and you do need to speak this, the truth to renew your mind. That's why it's true-ish. But it doesn't mean that if I speak enough that I'm going to have a new Lexus. It doesn't mean that if I claim it enough that everything in life is going to turn out the way that I want. And if it's not going my way, the way that I heard it in the church that I grew up in, well, it was either you didn't have enough faith, you weren't giving enough, you, you must have some unrepented, unconfessed sin in your life. Whatever the case may be, it always went back to you and why you weren't enough and why you didn't have enough of this or enough of that. And so with that in mind, it really enslaves a lot of people and gets them to focus on themselves because if I can get it, then I go, wow, I had enough faith. I am good enough. I did everything right and I checked all the boxes. But if I get it wrong and then bad things happen, I don't understand and I'm confused and then I automatically go to, my fault, to, to it being my fault. But these teachers will say things like, you're, you're a little G God, like you have God's ability on the inside of you. And there are true-ish statements to some of those things where, yes, God has put his spirit in you. But let me tell you something, you are not God. You're not God. And Jesus was not given so you could go out and just enjoy the finer things and be in the finer things club. Jesus came so you could have new life and that you could be made righteous in the eyes of God. That is the biggest blessing, not material wealth and not possessions. I mean, this is such a big deal, and there's so many people that are telling you, oh, hey, if you just, you know, look in the mirror every day and say you're, you're attractive, you're in shape, you're healthy, wealthy, and wise, and it's going to happen. But let me tell you something. You aren't God, and your positive affirmations of faith will only get you so far. You need to get a job. You need to learn to manage your finances. 
And you need to learn to stop eating cheeseburgers, cheese curds, and cheesecake every day before you get healthy. (laughs) Just because you look in the mirror and say you're going to be healthy doesn't mean you're healthy. Uh, A healthy person makes healthy choices. A wealthy person uses wisdom, and there is a ton of wisdom in Scripture on stewardship and how to be a wise steward. And we should be wise stewards, and we should trust God with our finances, but we shouldn't use God as a proverbial Santa Claus that if we do A, B, and C, that he's just going to give us all the things that we've ever wanted. That's an unhealthy view of God, and that message won't preach in a third world country. But the sad thing is, is that people are peddling those messages in third world countries. And I think it's hurtful to the body of Christ. These people, and many more like them, they say true-ish things. There there is a measure of truth, man. There is power in your words. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And they love it, are going to eat the fruit of it. Man, there's, there's truth there. There is truth. There is power in speaking the word of God. You should be thinking on the word of God, meditating on it, renewing your mind, speaking it but not so that you can just become the super wealthy, super affluent, super popular, super attractive person. That's not the purpose of speaking the Word of God. The purpose of speaking the Word of God is because I have bad thinking, (laughs) and I need to have my mind renewed to think in line with Scripture so that I'm valuing what God values because it goes from my head to my heart. And one of the ways that God knows that can happen is when we speak The Word of God, there is power, there is life, there is death in the power of the tongue. Those things are true. And there are true-ish things in our world that people will say, and man, we like it. Man, it's super attractive to us because we think it's the pathway for us to get what we want, what we're after, what we're chasing after. And then we get sidetracked from from pursuing Jesus because we begin to use Jesus to pursue things or position or or influence or popularity. And we're diminishing the purpose of why Christ came and we're making it all about us. We pursue messages that just make us feel good and and we want to be accepted because, I mean, come on, who doesn't want to be accepted? Uh, Here's a choice, be accepted or rejected. Yeah, I choose being accepted. But yet Jesus was rejected. He was despised. And, 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 and there were those who chose Barabbas instead of Jesus. I mean, and you and I, we're, we're a part of that, 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 that pendulum swing there where we think, oh, Jesus is good. I love him. But when he doesn't do the things I want, then I will quickly get distracted. And can I tell you that Jesus is more valuable than anything else that this world has to offer? Amen. And if I get the opportunity to live a life of comfort and ease in this earthly existence, then great. And if I don't, great. That's not the goal. The goal is for me to live with eternity in mind and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is not me getting everything I want and health, wealth, and and, and prosperity. The the gospel of Jesus Christ is that I was a sinner. I was an enemy of God. I was was rejected uh, because of my own rebellion, and I rejected God's goodness. and and, and, And now, because of faith in Jesus Christ, he took the punishment for all my rebellion, all my sin, all my rejection, all the ugliness in me. He, He took the punishment for that on himself so I could be made new, so that I could have new life, so I could now be adopted into the family of God and be called a son or a daughter, that is good news. Amen? So here's the deal. The people in the Apostle Paul's day that lived in the area of Galatia, which was a church in Asia Minor, were dealing with some similar things. There were people who were in their region who were teaching a false gospel, and they were teaching true-ish things. These people were called Judaizers. And these people had the mission of trying to use the message of Jesus and the message of Christianity to get Gentiles to convert to Judaism. And they used this as their path. They used Christianity as their way in because Christianity was becoming very popular among the Gentiles in Galatia, and it was being preached by people like Paul and many others. And then these Judaizers, they swept in and they said, let's capitalize on this market. This is a hot market to turn people into Jews. And so what they did was that they used the message of Christ and kind of walked it backwards. They said, yes, Christ, yes, Paul, what he's teaching, but then also, guess what? There's all this other now that you have to do. Let's start by being circumcised. Where's the line for that? Anybody want to get in line for, for circumcision? 
That's where they wanted to start because they were more interested in getting people to sign up to those outward signs, those things that you could say, hey, I've now become a Jew. They were like, yes, Jesus, but, 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 but become a Jew too. And so they were enslaving people to have to follow the law. But the problem with enslaving them to follow the law is that the law made them think that now I have to do everything a certain way and I have to follow all of these different ordinances and commands and rituals in order to be accepted by God instead of Christ alone and instead of grace alone. It was grace and Jesus, yes, but now do all this stuff too. And Paul heard about this. And it was, there's some truth to moral living. There's truth to living a holy life, but not at the cost of grace to where I began to think now somehow I've accomplished this and, and I've done this and I've achieved this. Not at the cost of you putting your works in tandem with what Christ has done because it's Christ alone, not Christ plus you. It's Christ alone. Jesus didn't say, hey, could you help me out a little bit? Um, I need a hand with, with uh, this uh, saving you thing and, 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 and perfecting you and, and sanctifying you. I, I, I need a hand with this because you got to do, you know, it's Christ alone. Christ saved us. That's why he gets all the glory because he's not going to share his glory. He doesn't go, man, you, you finally got good enough to be saved. You finally got good enough to be a Christian. No, it was Christ alone. He gets all the glory. And so for the glory to go to him, it's not going to be me getting the credit for my good works. And that was these Judaizers stepping in saying, yeah, but you got to become a Jew now. You got to do all these works. You got to follow the law. You got to do all these festivals. You got to hold your mouth just right. You got to say this just right. And on this day, you got to do this. And you got to make sure that you're, 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 you're understanding what uh, all these traditions that we've held for years. And then God will accept you if you have that kind of lifestyle. And Paul was just blown away that these people had bought into this, this true-ish type of teaching. And so Paul wrote this letter to them called Galatians, and he wrote this letter to help them to see the message that he preached to them was indeed legitimate, his apostleship was indeed legitimate, because that was coming into question as well, and then also he wanted them to be reminded of the true gospel, and he wanted to expose those false teachers around him. And so let's read this, Galatians chapter 1, let's read through verse 10. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches in Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you into the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. This is why at Word of Grace we say that we keep Jesus at the center because Christ alone is the hope of the world. We keep Jesus at the center. And that's what Paul is trying to get the Galatians to do. Keep Jesus at the center. The very first thing after Paul introduces himself here, says Paul, an apostle, he says, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Normally, <clears throat> when Paul writes a letter, you can read any of his other letters that he's written, some of his introductions are really long and, and, and really warm. This one, he kind of gets straight to the point. Paul goes straight for what matters here in this moment. He lets him know, listen, we're keeping Jesus at the center here because this is Paul. I'm an apostle, not from men, not by men, but because of Jesus and from Jesus and through God the Father. He said, this, this is who I am. Normally he's like, hey guys, long time no see. My heart, man, this longs to be with you. Remember the grace of our God. Here he just goes, I'm Paul an apostle, not of God or men. I mean, not, not from man, not because of man, but from God and from Jesus Christ. 
He lets them know what he's about. He lets them know what matters. And he's addressing right off the bat the issues that they're facing. And so he's trying to help them to see in this very beginning, in this opening, that Jesus is indeed the focus. And he's just astonished that they would believe these truish statements. He's astonished that they would buy into this teaching of the Judaizers because they've heard how rich this gospel is of Christ alone being the one who paid the price and who brought them into the family of God. He's blown away that they would be bewitched, that they would be tricked, that they would be turning away from something as if there were something else. Paul himself, he even says, I'm astonished how quickly you're turning to another gospel, if there even was another gospel, because gospel means good news. And the best news, the good news is Jesus. And you're saying there's something better? You're saying there's something better than Jesus? You're saying there's something else? You mean it's Jesus plus you? No, it's Jesus plus nothing that equals everything. Amen, church? And here Paul is saying, guys, we have to keep Jesus at the center. He said, I'm not seeking the approval of man. Because if I were seeking the approval of man, if that's what I was into, if I was trying to earn something and make man think well of me, I would not really be serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I would be serving your opinion or your thought, or I'd be serving the poll numbers, you know, my approval rating. I'd be serving that rather than serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, no, I'm going to keep Jesus at the center. I'm going to start off by keeping Jesus the main thing because he alone is the hope of the world. Don't be bewitched by pop culture or by teaching that makes much of man and minimizes Jesus. Oh, let me say that again because some of you were halfway paying attention. Don't be bewitched by teaching or pop culture that makes much of man and minimizes Jesus. There is so much, you guys, so much teaching in this world that wants to make much of man and doesn't want to include Jesus. It's almost like some preachers and teachers, they want to, they want to mention Jesus almost in a passive way just because they don't want to teach or preach and not mention Jesus. It's like they want to teach all these good things, how to become all these good things, how to do all these good things, how to have all these good things, how to experience all these things we would call good. And oh yeah, by the way, Jesus loves you. Or by the way, here's your one token scripture. Oh, by the way, you know, we'll, we'll pray in Jesus' name and, and there we mention Jesus. But everything else is just psychobabble. Everything else is just uh, pragmatism. Everything else is just, this is, this, this is the, the, the checklist of how you know you're okay and this is how to do this better. And there's so much teaching in the world and there are elements of truth in it and that's the part that drives me nuts. And I like some of the things that some people say and, and I'm, they're true-ish but they're missing the most important part of all. We can talk about racial reconciliation, but you can't talk about ra racial reconciliation without talking about hearts being changed by Jesus Christ. You just can't. You, you can't. I'm sorry. I can get up here and say, you should do this, we should do this, and this is wrong, and this shouldn't happen. This is an injustice in the world. And all those things are true. But the most important thing of all is that the heart of man needs to be changed. And I can't change that and you can't change that. I don't care what we try to do or what we embark upon. The most important thing is to keep Jesus at the center and teach and preach Jesus because he's going to change hearts. And then people of different ethnicities and backgrounds and value systems will be able to love one another better. Not because they did it, not because they figured it out, but because Jesus made them a different person. Because the problem is, is that who you are without Jesus is bad. And that's where people get off thinking and get into error thinking, apart from Jesus, they're a good person. I don't need Jesus, I'm a good person. Because they think they can be good on their own. There is nothing good in me except for Jesus. When I come to that realization, I never stop needing Jesus. It's not Jesus plus me. No, it's Jesus. It's just Jesus. And so you, we can try to fix the world's problems. We can try to put politicians into office who are going to create new policies that may make your life better. But unless the heart changes, nothing is really going to change. It's just going to be a different face with a different leadership, making the different policies to serve man's selfish agenda. Jesus is the hope. Not the president 
not the governor, not the mayor, not the senator, not the king. Jesus is the hope of the world. I don't know about you, but I'm like Jesus 2020. <laughs> because he's the hope, you guys. And, and Paul... Paul is, is, is trying to help the Galatians realize you guys are, are missing the mark here. You're trying, you're, you're trying to fix yourself and your problem with your own strength, and, or you're trying to use the law to do it now. Now you've identified there's a problem, but you're using the law instead of trusting solely in the grace of Jesus. You're missing this message truly of what Christ has done on the cross because you're mingling it with your own efforts and your own brand of righteousness and the scripture is very clear that our own brand of righteousness is like filthy rags. Be careful when people in this day and age say things like, hey, I know like we're all about Jesus, but let me stop you right there. Let me stop you with the but. I know we keep Jesus at the center, but let me stop you right there. Whatever you say, after the butt is like Charlie a Brown's teacher. Womp, 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 womp. Nothing else matters after that. After you say that word but, I'm done. Because it's not, I know we need Jesus. I know we keep Jesus at the center. But, pastor, you know, nope, I don't know. All I know is Christ and himself crucified. The apostle Paul said that very thing. He's like, guys, I, I've been to all the right schools. I've done all the right things. I was born into the right family. I consider it all rubbish. All I know is Christ and himself crucified. That's all I got. That's all I've got, and that's all we need. And that's why it's so important to keep Jesus at the center, because pleasing God and pleasing man are not compatible goals. They're, they're just not compatible. You can't pursue pleasing God and pleasing man. It's not going to work. You can't serve two masters, Jesus said. You see, we can't go after making sure everybody likes me. Everybody's happy with my sermon today. Everybody loves me. Approval ratings are through the roof except for those two people. Mm, I know who you are. No, I don't really. <clears throat> I don't know, someone told me the other day that like 10%, you know, wishes you weren't around. I don't know if that's true or not. I hope not. But anyways, <laughs> I read that statistic. It was sad. I, I said awe too. Um, but, <laughs> but anyways, when you think about stuff like that, you can go, oh man, I, I don't, oh man, I, I got to make sure, you know, I make this group happy, these people happy, these people happy, these people happy. And I can rack my brain trying to make everyone happy. And we know if there's anything that coronavirus has shown us, you can't make everybody happy. <laughs> because, <laughs> because when you have a problem that no one really knows the first and best solution, and everyone's throwing spaghetti against the wall to see what sticks. Some people don't like the spaghetti thrown against the wall. They don't like the ideas, they don't like the process, and you have to go, are we gonna love each other or are we just gonna argue over something no one's really dealt with before? You see, is, is Jesus at the center or are we focused on trying to make everybody happy? Can we just love each other in spite of maybe the misunderstandings, the disagreements? Can we still love each other, you see? If I love Jesus first, if I put Christ at the center, I'm in a position to do that. If I'm trying to please man, well, then I'm only going to follow man as long as he's making me happy, and then I'm going to shift gears because I'm all about man's approval or pleasing man. We can't do that. The Scripture says, Jesus himself said, a wise man builds his house on the rock, right? Something solid. Foolish man builds his house on the sand. What does the sand do? Every time there's a storm, it just shifts. It moves every single time. And his house can't stand. And I want to make sure that your house and that word of grace and that our family, that we can stand in the middle of challenges, that we can stand in the middle of all of the different waves of doctrine that try to toss us around, that we will be firmly planted on the word of God and knowing where our help comes from. And that is Jesus Christ. And that he is the hope of the world. And they, we, we won't be bewitched. We won't be, we won't be like these people that Paul's writing to, that he's astonished that they abandon the gospel for something else. Like, I know it's Jesus, but no, mm -mm. no, it's just Jesus. So does the message that you're hearing, the influences that you're listening to, the things that you're even saying and that those around you who are influencing you are saying, do those messages champion Jesus? Or does the message you're hearing champion your efforts, your, your good deeds, 
your own righteous acts or your amount of faith that you can have? Does it point people back to you or does it point them to Jesus? You see, I want to be pointing people to Jesus with my life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Paul goes on from there to talk about his calling, and he, he talks about how he was uh, trained up by different apostles, and then he goes on in chapter 2 to talk about when he actually opposed Peter, uh, the disciple of Jesus, to his face because Peter was only eating with Jewish people. He didn't want to be seen with the Gentiles, and so Paul confronts him because he's like, I thought we were all one in Christ. What's up with this? And so he confronts him on his hypocrisy, and so that's what he talks about in the next section. But let's go ahead and skip over to verse 3 because he kind of gets back to this idea of correcting the Galatians and helping them to see their error. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 through 9, he says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing, of, hearing, by, hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, that you're now going to be perfected in the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Man, here he says so much. He says, you guys, who has bewitched you? Did you somehow start off coming to faith in Christ with Jesus, and now you're going to be, perfect, be perfected another way? You're going to now pursue a path of perfection in your own strength? It's like, thanks for the saving, Jesus. Thanks for making me new. I got it from here. He said, is that how you think this works? Like you began in the spirit and now you're going to like finish in the flesh? Like you started in the spirit and you're like, oh, I'm new in the spirit. All right, now I'm going to, I got to work on all this other stuff and, and, and fix all this other stuff if God's going to still love me. No, it's, he said, why would you think that's how it worked? And then he uses Abraham. And he uses Abraham because now these people have been hearing about Abraham because these Judaizers are preaching, well, you've got to be a part of Abraham's family. Remember, Abraham was the one that God made covenant with. Remember, Abraham was the one who's the, the, the father of many nations. Remember what God did with Abraham and how he, how he promised all these things to Abraham. And you've got to be a part uh, of Abraham. And so they said the pathway to being connected to Abraham is through obeying the law of Moses, through this pathway of becoming a Jew. And and Jesus is like, I mean, Paul's saying, no, it was Jesus. You see, actually, how you're connected to the promises of God is through Jesus, not through works, not through adhering to the works, but actually, it is through Jesus. He says something really, really awesome here. In verse uh, 8, he says, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. So roll with me here for just a minute, all right? Let's look at this. He's saying, the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. So the gospel was preached to Abraham before basically prophesying that these Gentiles, these outsiders, were going to become a part of the family of God, that the good news to Abraham is that you're going to be a father of many nations, not just one nation, not just your people, but many people. And so he's saying that, that this is how the gospel is now open. This was actually promised to Abraham, and he said, in you, all the nations shall be blessed, Sit there and just look at that word for a minute. Let's think about that, underline it, highlight it, blessed. In you shall all the nations be blessed. That word blessed means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but depending on what you think blessed is. A lot of people, they use the word blessed in the context of my bills are paid, I'm blessed. 
Some people use the word blessed in the sense of, I just got, uh, you know, a, a really nice home. I'm blessed. Some people use the word blessed in the fact that I went on a really nice vacation, finally was able to take the kids to Disney World. We are so blessed. And that's how we normally use the word blessed when we talk about being blessed. We're talking about the things we're either able to do or the things that we own, the things that we have. So we're talking about material things or we're talking about human experiences when we say blessed. But that's not what that scripture means. He's not talking about because you're in Abraham, you have all this stuff. Because why would, why would that be attractive to someone who is outside of the family of God? You see, what blessed means in that context and what it means in this scripture and what it means in most scriptures that you read is that you were once a stranger. You were once outside of the family of God. There was no hope for you, but God himself came in the flesh, the man Jesus Christ, and he took your sin and he took your shame and he took the punishment that you deserved and he died on the cross, the sinner's death, even though he had never sinned so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be free, so that you could be called a son or a daughter of God. Friend, I don't know what you call blessed, but that's what I would call blessed. Amen. And I think that's what a Gentile person would call blessed. They weren't thinking, oh, now I get in God's goodie bag. No, now it's not about getting things. That's not what they were concerned with. That's not how they would have interpreted this. They would have said, I was on the outside, now I'm on the inside. I'm blessed because I'm now a child of God. I'm blessed because now I'm a son or a daughter of God. And so here, as he's talking about the blessing of Abraham, he's talking about you're a part of the family. You're, you weren't a part of the family before. You didn't get invited to Thanksgiving. You couldn't come. You didn't get invited to Christmas dinner. You didn't get invited to Easter. You, didn't, you couldn't come. No one cared when it was your birthday. You weren't a part of the family, but now you're in. And you had nothing to do with it. Jesus did it. And all you have to do is trust that what he did was sufficient. All you have to do is receive that. That's hard for us. That's why the just live by faith. And that's also why Jesus said it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because he looks at everything that he's accomplished and done and he takes credit for it. And he thinks it was all because of him. And he has a harder time seeing that he needs something. It's not impossible because Jesus said all things are possible with God. And what he meant is that even those who don't see their need because of their wealth, they can still be brought to a place to see their need. That's why Jesus told the rich young ruler, if you want to be perfect, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor so that you may have treasure in heaven so that you can come follow me, be a part. He's letting them know, it's, 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 do you see your need? Do you see your condition apart from Christ? Do you see blessing in being a part of the family of God? Like, is that a big blessing? Is it? Is it a big blessing or is there something else? Is there something else, Christian, that you're pursuing? Have you been bewitched? Have, have you been listening to false teachers that it's like Jesus plus this and it's Jesus and all these other things? Or, or is it just Jesus? It's not Jesus opens the door into God's family so that he's just holding the door and you can go and enjoy all of these things. No, it's Jesus opens the door. He's the gate. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. And behind the door, you get Jesus. And he's sufficient. And he is enough. He's not lacking anything in and among himself. If heaven and all the streets of gold and all the mansions and stories and good old Southern gospel songs that you heard, maybe, if all their descriptions of heaven are accurate and you get to enjoy all these lavish things and Jesus weren't, wasn't there, would it still be heaven? Would it still be heaven if Jesus wasn't there? Are you going to be in awe of all the things? Or are you going to be excited and in awe of Jesus? All those things are going to pale in comparison. Because they already do to the Christ follower. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world could offer. Here's our bottom line today. I want you to share this hashtag, W-O-G, bottom line. Take a picture of it. Put it on social media, however you want to do it. Thank you for doing that these past few weeks since we started that. But help preach this message. Here it is. Fixing your eyes on Jesus fixes the problem you can't fix. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, keeping Jesus at the center, and keeping your focus, your gaze, your heart, your pursuit fixed on him. It's going to fix the problem you can't fix. 
not Jesus plus all these other things, not you finally being accepted by the right crowd, not you finally be welcomed into the HOA, you know, not you finally getting that right parking spot, not you getting that position in the company, no, no, no. Fixing your eyes on Jesus is going to fix the problem you can't fix. Because we all have a problem that we can't fix, and Jesus is the answer. I don't care what it is. Jesus is the answer to racism. Jesus is the answer to the economy. Jesus is the answer to the political uh, scene that we have going on in our nation. Jesus is the answer to all the wars going on around the world. Jesus is the answer to all the homelessness and the poverty experience in our country. Jesus is the answer for all of the marriages that are uh, under a great strain right now. Jesus is the answer for those wayward children, for all of those who are not living for Jesus Christ. Jesus is the answer for your jerk boss. Jesus is the answer for that neighbor that you hope doesn't get, you know, uh, cut their grass at the same time you do so you don't have to deal with them. Jesus is the answer for your gossiping, your pride, your lying, and all of your hypocrisy. Jesus is the answer. He's the answer for addiction. He's the answer for chains and shame and guilt. He's, he's the answer, and he is enough. He's sufficient. There is no one greater than Jesus. And fixing your eyes on Jesus is going to fix the problem you can't fix. I believe that's what Paul was trying to communicate to the Galatians. He said, again, in verse 8 of chapter 3, the scripture for seeing God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. They are blessed. What are they? They're called righteous in the eyes of God. They're made right in the eyes of God. If you, if you knew Jesus was returning tonight, like if, you know, we're not going to know that because Scripture is explicitly clear. He's coming like a thief in the night. No man knows the hour. No man knows the day. We, we, we get that. So I'm not trying to forecast that. But I'm just saying, if, if somehow you did, if you knew he was coming like tonight, what would your priorities be for the rest of the day? I want you to just think about that thought. What would your priorities be? My guess is that you would want to tell people to put their faith in Jesus. Um, my guess is that you would be evaluating your own heart. You would be looking, am I really trusting and putting my own faith in Christ? Uh, my guess is that you would want to live in light of eternity as much as you could. You would want to Make phone calls to those loved ones who live far away. Talk to them. Help, you know, get, get someone to help you with Zoom so you could, you know, talk to somebody. <laughs> I can't hear you. I can see you, but I can't, I can't hear you. I can see you now, but I can't. Mm. That's how it goes. That's been our life for the past, like, nine months. <clears throat> We would be talking to everybody, wouldn't we? It, wouldn't we? Wouldn't that? Would our, how much would our priorities shift if we knew when? Our priorities would shift a lot. But it doesn't take any faith to live that way. You see, it takes faith to live knowing that I don't see it, but yet I know that it's true and I know that he's coming. And so it shouldn't change my priority. I should still live with that priority even though I don't know because I have faith, because I don't see it. I, I don't know when, but I know it's true. And that's what faith is, the, the evidence of those things that, that, that I, I, I can't see. It's that substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that aren't seen, as Hebrews 11, 1 talks about. That's what faith is, and that's how we trust in Christ. And that's the way we should live our lives and the type of priority we should place in our lives you see, I think we should be called to live in light of eternity. It helps us fix our eyes on Jesus and remember the gospel, to cling to the truth and not to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by all this trickery and cunning and deceitful schemes that would try to get our eyes off of Jesus. Discerning the truth and discerning priorities matters because, church, I, I, I love you enough to warn you that there are many voices in this world, we are bombarded with more voices than ever before in humanity's history. 
I mean, everybody has a voice. And you can hear voices from all over the world. You can read their articles. You can read their posts. You can watch their videos. Everyone has their own TV channel if they want it. Everyone has a, a method to communicate their agenda and their message. And some messages gain more traction and more popularity than others. And if you want to find a message that agrees with your opinion, you probably don't have to look very far because there are so many people with so many voices and platforms. Used to, we would just listen to a few people because there were just a few platforms. I remember I grew up, we only had like five channels, and that was if I got up and adjusted, you know, the antenna on the TV, and my dad would let me go over there and say, we could get Fox if I held it just right. He, there it is. And there you go, and there's my afternoon. I have to stand right there. No, he wasn't that bad. He didn't make me stand there. Um, I don't remember anyways. But now everybody has a channel. Everybody has a voice, and we can watch it in the palm of our hand at our convenience with our cell phones. And you need to be able to know how to listen to the right voices. It's so imperative because a lot of those people are saying things that are true-ish. A lot of those people are, are saying things that, oh, feel good, oh, sounds good. Mm, I found somebody who thinks like me. Yeah, but are you thinking right? It, is it bringing your attention and your focus to Jesus? And, and I can't sit up here and name every name of every false teacher. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to sit up here and tell you all the books you should read and shouldn't read. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you all the songs you should and shouldn't listen to. That's not my job. You have the Holy Spirit and you have His Word. You can discern. I'm just wanting you to see that the way to discern and the way to know what is right, the way to know what is true, is it drawing my heart to Jesus. Because if I fix my eyes on Jesus, it fixes the problem I can't fix. Because, man, there's a lot of voices. I need to stay fixed on Jesus. Oh, oh, I'm starting to drift. Oh, I need to reset. I need to fix my eyes on Jesus. Oh, I'm tempted. Oh, I'm, I need to fix my eyes on Jesus. And for some of you, fixing your eyes on Jesus is, it, it, it's imperative that you get connected to other believers, but maybe even connection in this assembly here. Those of you who are online that are watching, you've got to get connected somehow, some way. I, I appreciate that you watch Word of Grace online, but if there is a church in your area that you can get connected to people in that is a Jesus-preaching, God-loving church, get connected to those people because you need those relationships. It's not just about you consuming more content. You need connection. It matters, amen? I know it's challenging during these times because some people aren't comfortable, you know, coming. And that's okay. We, we still love you. We're, we're, not, we're not shaming you for that. But you've got to find a way to get connected because the enemy's biggest trap is to make you feel like you're all alone. The enemy's biggest trap is to isolate you, get you trapped in your thoughts, and then all of a sudden he starts spewing those negative one-liners or those situations and gets you to hit the repeat button and you just get stuck in a loop thinking about the negativity, the isolation, the loneliness, or how no one understands. And can I tell you, Jesus is going to fix that if you'll just fix your attention on him. And sometimes we need others to help us do that. Amen? We need each other to help us to do that. I need other people to help me do that. I, I, I drift. We all drift. We all need that in our lives. But we need to discern truth because I don't want us getting distracted with truish doctrines and rightish causes. Because there's causes that this world wants to get you wrapped up in. There's things that they want you to get so excited and all enamored with and all worked up about. And they seem right. There's a way that seems right to a man. Oh, but is it fixing my eyes on Jesus? Or is it a distraction? It could be a good Worthy cause, that's what we say. A worthy cause. Well, the most worthy cause is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the most worthy cause of all. Because it is Jesus that is truly the answer. Because Jesus fixes the problem you can't fix. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to evaluate your own heart. And here's a great tool of evaluation. We're going to do this with the word. All right? 
So this week, today, tomorrow, maybe every day this week, however you want to do it, all right? I want you to read through Galatians because he's going to talk about a lot of things in Galatians that are going to be really relevant. He's going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit of God living on the inside of you. And that fruit is not some sort of checklist. That fruit is actually the results of a life that is surrendered to Jesus. He's going to talk about what the Spirit-filled life looks like. He's going to talk about what these types of fruit that, and results that you should see coming out of your life because of Jesus being at the center. He's going to talk about how you, you need to stay away from different things that would want to entice you so that you could just go on doing whatever you want to do or pursuing whatever you want to pursue. And he wants you to understand what grace truly is so that you can be confident in your faith. And so I want you to read the book of Galatians. There's, there's just a, a, a little bit more. It's not like this big, long, huge novel. It's six chapters. I mean, it's only like three pages in my Bible. And so I want you to take that and I want you to read that this week. And I want you to ask God as you read it to help you to fix your eyes on Jesus. Because we can identify with these Galatians. We can be foolish and distracted. We can be bewitched. We can get caught up in the day that we live in. That's what was happening there. We can listen to another voice as if there was another gospel, but, but, but something that would want to pull us away from fixing our eyes on Jesus. And I want you to read Galatians this week. Can you do that? Can you do that? It's, it's not hard. I believe in this all. We can do this. Maybe you want to read it every day. Maybe you want to read it multiple times a day. I don't know. Maybe there's someone here that you want to read it with. Maybe somebody online. Maybe you need to find somebody who can do a Zoom call with you and you guys could read it together and talk about it. Whatever the case may be, let, let's focus as a church collectively on the book of Galatians this week with the intent of fixing our eyes on Jesus. Because as we fix our eyes on Jesus, it's going to fix the problem we can't fix. So Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity. You are good. You are gracious. And we need you to open our eyes to see our true need because we can so often get distracted with the wrong things. And we don't want to do that anymore, Lord. We don't want to be bewitched. We don't want to be deceived. We want to know what is right. And we want to understand your grace in a new way, in a deeper way that connects us more to the message of the gospel and that connects us more to the family of God and that brings us, Lord, to a place where we truly put our faith and hope in Jesus Christ. We thank you for this in Jesus' name, amen.